After about a decade of self-censorship due to the Comics Code Authority, comics had pretty much become kid stuff in the eyes of most of the public. By the late 1960s, a group of artists were coming of age and, well, they had grown up reading the wacky Golden Age comics as well as the twisted but artistically sophisticated EC comics. They wanted to make comics. And they wanted to do it in a time of political, social, cultural, and artistic upheaval. So as you probably know, the 1960s was a time of massive political and social strife. The Cold War was a tight, there was nuclear panic, fear that atom bombs could drop any second, and proxy wars being fought, like the Vietnam War, which raged from 1964 to 1975. It was also a time of massive cultural change. The civil rights movement was happening. Second wave feminism was on the rise. The gay rights movement was beginning. And of course, a huge anti-war movement was happening across the country in response to the Vietnam War. Many of the folks behind these cultural changes were called the counterculture. Anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment movements began in earnest after the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1963, and as the U.S. became more involved in Vietnam. These counterculture movements were fomented by new media. TV, while not brand new, was suddenly much more widely available. In Hollywood film, the Hayes Code, which was sort of the comics code for film, had recently been broken down and wasn't being followed to the same extent anymore. Rock and roll was on the rise, and FM radio was changing the way people had access to it and could hear it and interact with artists and DJs. Hippie culture in particular had a huge influence on underground comics. Hippie culture was influenced by several counterculture movements, including the sexual revolution and avant-garde artists. So comics with an X, which is often how underground comics are separated from comics for kids, really begin to emerge in 1968. What's often called the first underground comic is done by Robert Crumb. He sells Zap Comics No. 1, a self-published zine out of a baby carriage in Haight-Ashbury, in San Francisco. This is the apocryphal birth of the underground comics movement. Now when we say underground comics, what we mean are small press or self-published comics, usually deeply personal and satirical in nature. They usually depict taboo material, stuff about drugs, sex, violence. They include really lewd language. They're pushing all of the boundaries and all of the buttons in order to shock people. And at the head of the underground comics movement, is the author of Zap Comics, R. Crumb. R. Crumb is known for his cross-hatched, hyper-detailed style that tends to exaggerate ugliness. His work is deeply personal, but it's also often very controversial. He has zero filter, which sometimes we think of as a good thing, but he's often writing about his sexual obsessions and sexual anxieties, which means it can be kind of uncomfortable to read. He also uses racial stereotypes, which is intended as satirical, but often comes off deeply disturbing. He founded Zap Comics and would be its primary contributor, but as it became more popular, would bring several other artists into Zap Comics' fold and would make San Francisco the center of the underground comics movement. Now, Arkham and Zap Comics are particularly influenced by Golden Age comics and especially by EC comics. Now that you've read some, here are just some quick examples of what the inside and covers of Zap Comics would look like. These guys clearly are referencing the form of EC Comics. So who are some of the other folks involved? Well, there's Gilbert Shelton. Shelton had been working since 1968. He was working on stories like Feds and Heads, Bijou Funnies, and Wonder Warthogs. But his most famous work is The Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers sometimes called a counterculture Three Stooges, or more crudely, a stoner Three Stooges. They first appeared in 1968, but would get their own title in 1971, which would run on and off until 1997. Then there's Dennis Kitchen. He was inspired to self-publish comics after reading Crumb and Shelton. He's now better known less as an artist in his own right and more as a publisher of independent artists. He would go on to found Kitchen Sink Press, which would publish works of many underground figures and other modern important figures in comics like Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, Dave McKean, Eddie Campbell, James O'Barr, who wrote The Crow, and the first edition of Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics is actually printed through Kitchen Sink Press. He's also the founder of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, 
which is a group dedicated to raising money to help fight comic book censorship around the world. Kim Deitch was the son of animator Gene Deitch, who was frequent, and as a result, frequently incorporated the iconography of American cartoons and popular culture from the 40s and 50s into his work. His 1991 graphic novel, Boulevard of Broken Dreams, would win great critical acclaim. And it was originally published in Raw, which was Art Spiegelman's magazine in the 1980s. Kim Deitch was briefly married to Trina Robbins, who established the first all-women comic book, It Ain't Me Babe Comics, in 1970. She was a major influence in establishing women's comics, an anthology comics title that was published between 1972 and 1992. She's an outspoken critic of misogyny in comics publishing, both mainstream and underground. She's also worked as a comics historian and researcher, finding previously unknown women comics creators in the Golden Age. Aileen Kaminsky Crum met R. Crum after moving to San Francisco in the early 70s to make comics. The two got married in 1978. She originally worked with women's comics, but ended up falling out with Trina Robbins and founded her own woman comic anthology, Twisted Sisters. She doesn't do comics as much anymore. She's mostly a painter and an autobiographer. Then there's Justin Green. His book, his 1972 story, Binky Brown Meets the Holy Virgin Mary, is often considered the first graphic memoir. It wasn't as popular as some of the other artists I've mentioned at the time, but his work has retroactively been recognized as massively influential on artists like Art Spiegelman. Spiegelman is often seen as a figure of transition between underground and alternative comics. That's one of the reasons we're reading Mouse, is it sits on the boundary between the underground movement and the alternative movement. The earliest version of Mouse actually appears in the comic Funny Aminals in 1972. Funny Aminals also featured our Crumbs art. These are just some examples of the visuals of this version of Mouse. You can see it's clearly playing with some of the same ideas, but also looks very, very different. Prisoner on a Hell Planet, A Case History, the short comic that he includes in Mouse, was published in Short Order Comics in 1973. Spiegelman's future wife, Francois Molly, was an editor and publisher as well as an art editor at The New Yorker. She moved to the U.S. from France in 1974 and contacted Spiegelman after having read Prisoner on a Hell Planet. The two began a relationship shortly after that and moved to France. They moved back to the U.S. and in 1978 founded Raw Books and Graphics. And in 1980, Raw Books and Graphics began publishing the magazine Raw. Raw debuted in July 1980 and ran until 1991. It featured avant-garde art comics in an anthology format and included the work of artists like Linda Berry, Charles Burns, R. Crum, Kim Deitch, Juice Swart, Jacques Tardy, Chris Ware, Alan Moore, and of course, Spiegelman and Mouly. Now, R. Crum would eventually criticize Raw as too highbrow because he felt comics should stick to its lowbrow roots. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the future when we discuss the difference between the underground comics and the alternative comics movement. The first issue of Mouse, as we recognize it today, was published as a small insert in the second issue of Raw. It would be serialized throughout Raw magazine through the rest of the story, except for the very final chapter, which would only be published in the collected edition of Mouse 2 in 1992. It's hard to imagine now, but initially Spiegelman had a really hard time finding a publisher for Mouse. In the 80s, graphic novels weren't a thing. However, a rave review in the New York Times led an editor at Pantheon Books to offer to publish the first six chapters as volume one in 1986. It was a huge success. And as a result, volume two was published in 1991. And as I mentioned, the final chapter was published in that book. Now, if you're a comics fan, it's hard to understate the importance of Mouse in the history of American comics. Mouse was very popular and critically massively well-received. It was influential in changing the way that people thought about comics. People thought comics were just kid stuff, but well, Mouse won a Pulitzer Prize in 1992. Comics could be taken seriously by people who had never thought to take them seriously before. 
Besides being important among critics and popular perception of comics, Mouse is also highly influential to comic artists, and especially among independent and alternative artists. In the next few sessions, we'll be exploring Mouse in more detail, including talking about Marian Hirsch's groundbreaking essay on Spiegelman's text. See you then. <laughs>